So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Roberts, and I'm the editor in chief at the Security Ledger, and uh, which is a cybersecurity news website. Um, and probably more relevant for this panel, I'm the founder of SecureRepairs.org, which was a group I set up about uh, four or five months ago, uh, specifically to reach out to and um, uh, organize the information security community in support of right to repair laws that are um, that are pending in 20 states uh, this past year and that we're trying very uh, hard to try and get passed. Uh, and I felt like this was an issue that was incredibly important to the information security community, but that um, we were not um, paying attention to. And so I started securerepairs.org uh, and uh, to sort of raise awareness about that. Oh, sorry. One second. Uh, up, there's a slide up there where it's got the, the website. Um, but I, before we start, uh, before we did dive in, I thought I'd give each of my panelists uh, a chance to introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them. We have an amazing panel, as you know, but uh, in case you're not familiar with them, I'm going to go to, let's just go down in order here and everybody sort of uh, say who you are and talk about, you know, your superpower. Uh, hello, I'm Tara Wheeler. Uh, I am a cybersecurity policy fellow at New America. Um, and right now, I am still totally mind blown over the OpenCTF competition yesterday, where I'm busy trying to figure out how to dump a microprocessor for the first time, which is probably the best reason to go anywhere, right? I completely opted out of the parties last night. I know it doesn't look like it, but I did. Uh, there was bourbon in the room, so you know, big uh, so that's that's the fun right at the moment. And one of the major reasons I'm on this panel and showed up on time is so I can bring it here and make Joe help me with my homework. <laughs> um, Thanks I, for coming, Tara. Yes. <laughs> Um, my name is Joe Grant. Some of you might know me as Kingpin. Um, I'm a professional design engineer, but also a hardware hacker, and grew up hacking on products um, to do things they weren't intended to do. So probably breaking all sorts of laws nowadays. Uh, and designing products, I designed the DEFCON badge, and really a proponent of open source hardware, sharing information, um, and being able to own stuff that I buy with my own money and not be bound by various licenses. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Kyle Weens. I started iFixit. We are the open source repair community. Our mission is to enable everybody to fix all their stuff. Uh, <laughs> shout out to all the San Luis Obispo people in the room. You want me to lather? No, no, just speak into one mic or the okay. other so that they can turn one on and one off. Sure, you got it. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, so along the way of I mean, our mission to enable everybody to fix everything, well, there are, there are systematic, cultural, societal, and legal barriers to that. And so we have been chipping away at those. Uh, the initial barrier was that manufacturers were using DMCA threats to get service manuals offline. And I remember trying to fix an iBook. I couldn't find the service manual. So I uh, decided to make my own and publish it online. And we've been doing that ever since. And that's just been an end run around copyright law and the, the sort of diabolical enforcement of of you know, lack of information to block repair, but it, but since then we found there are other barriers. Everything from DMCA twelve oh one to you know access to parts, trademarks on parts, and so we've been systematically chipping away at that. And uh, we helped start Repair.org, which is a kind of trade association for the professional uh, repair world to fight back. And I have spent more time in suits than I would like the last decade or so in DC. Uh, you know, fighting for our right to be able to fix our stuff. It's been an interesting battle, uh, and I think we're we're really just just getting started. But it's pretty exciting to to be here and uh, have come this far. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Nathan Proctor. I'm the national campaign director um, for US Perg's Right to Repair campaign. US Perg is a national uh, advocacy nonprofit which stands up for the public whenever their rights are threatened. Um, and so we, uh, we have been engaged with the Right to Repair campaign for a few years now. And because we're a network of state advocacy organizations, um, basically I coordinate state campaigns on Right to Repair. And we had bills in 20 states this year. Uh, we didn't really have campaigns in all those states, but we, we <laughs> had at least ca campaigns in many, many, many states. So I also have to run around in a suit way too much. I think the worst part about that is I go to meet with legislators who've heard the same unbelievable load of malarkey from industry representatives, like the crazy stuff I've heard industries. I heard a Comcast lobbyist say 
that if you had the diagnostic tools for their routers, like their home cable routers, you could take out the broadband network, which I thought. So it's like you have these people who make nine fifty an hour driving a white truck around. They have a tool that takes out the network, and that's never leaked. Okay, I believe that. Um, it has now. It, it has. Uh oh. <laughs> Newsflash. Yeah. That, if that's the case, they shouldn't have their lobbyists tell that to a crowded room full of people. What? Because I can. Um, but so anyway, so yeah. So and and for us, uh, let's get to the ethics of it. Like, you know, we believe that there's a big problem in our society where we're losing kind of democracy and power on every level, and one of those ways is you know, the power that people have over their own lives and their own technology. Because we don't know, they don't want us to know how it works. They want us to just accept whatever terms they give us. They make aside a 25 page legal document full of malarkey. I'm using that. I've used malarkey twice now. It's, uh, good. it's good. It's funny. Um, so, I mean, so w we believe that we need to reclaim power for the public over technology. And one of the most compelling arguments and ways to have that conversation with the most number of people is to talk about our right to fix, you know, mostly this device. I mean, mostly people talk about this device, but it's everything from, you know, cell phones to tractors. And in fact, Kyle's got the ECU from a John Deere tractor if anyone wants to help us uh, <laughs> cause some trouble with that. Um, but yeah. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna do a, let's do a little poll just to just to set a baseline maybe before we start our conversation, right? Um, <laughs> you don't even know what I'm asking for. You don't even know what I'm asking about, and it's already unethical. Um, um, how many of you think that it is uh, that uh, well ethical or unethical? Um, Opening your iPhone and replacing the uh, battery with uh, an Apple certified battery, ethical or unethical? Okay, okay. Um, I question. Think that was consensus. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. For those out there in TV land, everyone yeah. voted ethical. Maybe we should do one for us and then flip it around for the TV audience. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be the consensus person. Yes, okay. Um, okay, second question. Uh, ethical or unethical, opening your iPhone and replacing the Apple authorized battery with a non-authorized battery, with a third-party battery. Ethical or unethical? Okay. Okay, good. We have unanimous consent. Okay. <laughs> ethical. Um. Uh, third question, uh, taking apart your iPhone and uh, turning it into a, a back massager. <laughs> if you could actually get the thing open. Which back? <laughs> okay, it, so so far, it's going to be pretty shitty for d discussion because everybody thinks that's ethical as well. No, I mean, that, I, I kind of felt like yeah, I mean, we were yeah, saying. We're, like, we're going to dive into this. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're going to dive into this. I'm not actually sure we're going to try and convince you otherwise, but but um, I think we, we felt like this is, you know, DEF CON is probably a, a friendly audience for us as opposed to a, a hostile audience. So that's not surprising in and of itself. But um, how many how many public, just hands, this isn't ethical or unethical, um, are familiar with what we're talking about with the right to repair? Okay, pretty good. Um, but not everyone. So um, I thought I'd start off by asking um, uh, Nathan and Kyle, and maybe just start with you, Nathan. When we're talking about right to repair, um, just to be clear, we're all talking about the same thing. What are we talking about, really? Yeah. So I would say right to repair is probably, on some level, like kind of an open source concept uh, that people take to mean different things, like the ease of repair, the ability to repair, but uh, really specifically – when we talk about right to repair, typically we're talking about a law that would be passed by, by in the state level, which would require manufacturers of anything with basically that runs software to provide that individuals and independent uh, technicians with the same tools to fix the thing that they would make available to their authorized network. So, and that's it's defined as five different things in the bill: spare parts, diagnostic software. Any special tool, like a penalobe screwdriver, for example, even though the iFixit one is probably better than the one Apple makes. Um, uh, any, any firmware that's needed, uh, as well as documentation, um, schematics, schematics um, repair documentation. We, okay. we do have a question. Hold on. I'll oh, get the question okay. in a minute. So I would like to ask 
uh, ethical, unethical question about this. So, in regards to the law, I would say that this is a great thing. However, I don't give a shit. Is it ethical or unethical if I do this anyway? So basically, there's, there's a, we're proposing a law to protect the, the researchers who do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So am I acting ethically or not if I do it anyway? You may possibly be preaching to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I did see one card halfway. So... What? All right. And a matter of fact, you're right. It was cake or pie. <laughs> so, would you like to come up and talk to me, or would do you want me to paraphrase you? What? Why were you hesitant to pick one or the other? So I come up. You heard me stand up. Cake, cake versus pie. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know. No, don't be sorry. It's okay. This is the best part. You don't need to be sorry. It's really good. Come on. Don't speak your mind. So we do have this idea of, yeah, I, so I'm definitely in Joe's camp of the, or I forget which one of you proposed the turn it into a back massager. Yes, that was you. Cool. Joe and I look yeah. a lot alike. Yes. yes. You no, know I do. It's, 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 you don't want me repairing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the side card comes up from this idea of there are some of these um, comes from a, uh, a more ethical use of the patent and copyright process of this idea of there we can some a a idea of how this law could be used in a slightly more ethical way could come from this idea of trying to protect indeed uniquely patent uh, unique uniquely unique unique circuit boards or designs or things like this that could have taken a large amount of R and D work and could cause independent researchers to not be able to basically, if I can open up my circuit board and copy it down and steal parts from it, then there is something to be said for potentially hurting independent researchers. Do I think that we should have a massive, like, cool, never open your device ever? No, obviously not. That would be terrible. But one thing that I always find interesting in this debate is how do we support these independent researchers and these people building truly unique products while still allowing people to fix their stuff? So that's so that's comparing like I, IP theft, right? Saying somebody could easily open up the product to counterfeit it, as opposed to repairing it, right? Is that that's different? So you get corn. Thank you very much. That was a great question. So I want I want to throw out. So back in the eighties, I can remember the eighties. Um, the the IBM processor was reverse engineered so that folks could clone PCs and start the entire revolution that we are reveling in right now. Uh, they basically violated the IBM patent and they reverse engineered this and they designed rules on how they did this. They black boxed the thing. They basically made a device that was like this chip. and. I'm not Joe Grant. He could probably speak about this better. But, you know, I was there when this was being done and this whole thing blossomed. And the whole point I'm trying to make is, as a cybersecurity researcher, I am not going to let the law stand in my way when I'm trying to do something for the greater good. And I don't think that that's an unethical action. And that was a point I was trying to make. And then... Yeah, and I, I do. I think that's actually. A, I think it's a halfway. great question, though. Yeah, it's a great question because there is, as an independent designer, I've had my stuff copied in China, right? And it's funny because it's open source, so people can copy it anyway. Um, but it's still, I'm technically losing money. Um, but I think there's some. There has to be some way in the in the law is not. So basically, the law is not going to stop people who are going to do it anyway, right? Someone's going to counterfeit the product. Um, the legislation is basically not to, it's not going to fix that. It's to at least enable the large corporations to give enough information out to people for the ordinary act of repair. So it doesn't have to be the entire kimono, you know, open up the entire kimono. It's just something, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, what is it when, when, uh, when the government was trying to do like 
something with encryption backdoors back in the 90s or something. And it was like if you know governments uh, out, um, what, outlaw encryption, only, encrypt, or only outlaws will use encryption, right? Isn't that the thing? Of like people are going to do that anyway. So I, I, I understand what you're saying. I think there's a balance, but it really is these large corporations preventing independent repair shops from repairing things they own, and that's the that's the problem. The only thing I yeah. worry about is the future. What about autonomous vehicles? Do we allow anybody to repair those? Yeah, I mean anybody can repair their but car. An autonomous vehicle on the road that could run over your child. Or do you trust the corporation that's running that? somewhere else that right. may not be patching their system or, or an, an autonomous like, vehicle an autonomous vehicle business, right we don't know yet. an autonomous vehicle under the control of the corporation could run over your child sure. right but that actually i think we talked about this on, on the phone earlier yeah. an autonomous vehicle in the future might be a subscription service where you op opt into it you're not buying the vehicle that's right right if you buy the vehicle like a tesla that has the autopilot functionality that's different than in the future where you just get in a car that you don't pay time on or something. So that's, if you own it, you should be able to do something with like it. I'm or, a student, or you should yeah. just understand what the service you're buying into is. So I'm a student pilot and I started carrying a multi-tool around. And the first time you ever repair a, uh, a, a loose screw on an aircraft that you're about to fly is when you start to really realize the ethical constraints of what you're doing right or if you're going to be somebody who's going to repair things you're also taking responsibility for the damage your repairs can do and for your own safety in so doing and it may seem trivial to tighten down a screw on a strut but when there is a full maintenance bay there and you choose to do it yourself the first time and take that responsibility yourself there's um there's a there's a weight of responsibility that settles onto you and also a set of skills that needs to get transferred outside a specialized <laughs> profession and actually, if you even think about, forget about flying a plane, like changing, if your tire blows out on the on the side of the road and you replace your own tire, you know, the consequences of you doing a crappy job of that are, are serious, just as serious as, a, uh, as an autonomous vehicle, right? If you don't put the lug nuts on right and the, the wheel falls off, you know, you could kill yourself, you could injure other people, right? There's, there is yeah. actually a huge amount of responsibility that goes on to changing your tire correctly. But none of us sit around debate whether we should be allowed to change a tire on our own vehicle. Right. That's just not a debate that we have as a society, even though you could you could think, well, I mean, your responsibility to the rest of society of changing a tire correctly, you know, compels it that only, you know, only a tire changing professional should ever be able to do something like that. Right. I mean, it, well, now to that point on the tire changing thing, decades, I mean, even before I was born back in the 1800s, the, uh, or late 1800s, when cars first came out, uh, and someone had to stop and do a roadside repair or change a tire, there was an entire procedure that they had to do, including going out and uh, standing near their vehicles, checking to make sure there are no horses within 200 feet, firing a weapon into the air to warn others that they're doing it. It was a whole process, <laughs> right. I'm not kidding. And, yeah. and, but eventually, it, it, we just decided, pull, you know, pull over and do it, thing. you can just change your own right. tire, and that's it. Okay, Kyle, you wanted to say something, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, to rewind a bit to the, the conversation about uh, counterfeiting, I, I think it's, it's interesting to... The, the information that the law is requiring, to go back to, to what sure. Nathan was saying about what's, what's in the information, the, like, the closest thing to uh, maybe uh, proprietary information that we're looking for is the schematics. Uh, so I, I love this. This is a schematic that fell off the truck in China. Uh, this, this leaked out of the box on fact. You can see this is an Apple Confidential... Uh, so this is for the, the charging circuit in the iPhone, which is something that commonly fails. Uh, all of the, the Chinese, uh, all of Apple schematics uh, generally leak. Uh, and there's actually, there's a really cool tool called ZXW. It stands for Zillion Time Work, and it's designed for repair shops, but it's a completely interactive board viewer. And you just select the iPhone model you want to look at, and you can follow it, trace all the way through, and see, okay, that resistor is a, you know, exactly what the specification is. It's fantastic, and it's it's completely built on this sort of Shanzai kind of open market. Now, Joe, have you taken apart any of the counterfeit iPhones? You ever looked at them? No, I've not, I've not seen them, but I've seen counterfeit. I, I was actually just in, in Shenzhen and saw iPhone repair shops. There's a, a separate section in Shenzhen just for that, and you can go and, and buy the manuals. And actually, yep. when I bought them, I had to kind of hunt, hunt the right people down. Um, and when I bought them, the woman said, just for repair. I said, yeah, just for repair. And there's all sorts of replacement components there. I haven't seen counterfeit ones, but there's a whole market striving trying to fix devices so they don't end up in the trash, right? That 
Yeah. It exists. And so the interesting thing, if you open up one of these counterfeit phones and you look at it, the schematic is not this. Yeah. If you're building a counterfeit iPhone, you don't do it this way. You build it from scratch and you lay out your own board design, you're using different parts, they're probably cheaper than what Apple did, and you just do it a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that the original schematics are useful for counterfeiting is not generally true. What they're useful for is security research and repair. That's what we need them for. Uh, yeah. Somebody. Sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, Kyle, before we, uh, as we're kind of going along in this, it might be useful just again as a baseline to talk about. Um, hmm? um, yeah. Oh, um, it might be useful to. Double. Uh, see how it's, it's repeating the left side of the. Oh, yeah. Oh. oh. Are we able to repair the projector? Are we allowed to? <laughs> Feel free to take it apart. Hey, how's it going? I told you I was going to get some help with my homework today. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, baby. <laughs> we can keep talking while... Okay. Um, Kyle, I thought maybe it would be useful for you to talk about some of the ways that um, OEMs, that manufacturers of devices, um, restrict repair and some of the impediments to to uh, any of us who might want to uh, repair, let's say, a late model iPhone or, or uh, Android phone. Yeah, so let me just walk you through just kind of a random smattering of, of ways that we see manufacturers blocking repair. Uh, I've got this John Deere ECU, so let's let's start with tractors and then we'll work our way into iPhones. Uh, uh, the local farmer, Farmer Dave, uh, called me up and said, hey, I've got this John Deere tractor. I said, cool, how much did it cost? He said, oh, it was about $300,000. I'm like, yeah, that's about the, size, the cost of a house. Cool. He says, yeah, it won't boot. I'm like, what do you mean your tractor doesn't boot? He says, well, it won't turn on. Like, okay, well, well, what happens is, well, the touch screen is giving me this error code. And I called I called Deere and they sent somebody out and they plugged their, their laptop in and it said that this particular sensor has failed. Uh, and the sensor isn't going to come until next week, but I need to run the tractor this weekend to do the harvest. Is there any way you can bypass the sensor to get the tractor to boot? And so I went out there with my laptop and my naivete and I said, I will help you fix it. And I completely fell flat on my face and failed. And, and the reason is that you need John Deere's proprietary diagnostic software. This, this diagnostic software, they are so paranoid that their technicians will give it to the farmers that it all erases itself every 90 days from the John Deere technician laptops. Uh, and so there are these dark net forums where people have, like there's this uh, dark net Ukrainian forum where you can get like cracked versions of the John Deere diagnostic software. And so the tractors or the farmers that are clever are out there using this cracked software that who knows what other modifications were made to it along the way of them getting it because they are not security experts. Uh, so, and, and John Deere is doing this. Why? Well, they, they want to make more money on those service calls. So it's the $150 an hour service call. They're generally like breaking even on the sale of the tractor and making more money on the service over the long run. So that's an example. Uh, the iPhone, since Apple uh, started putting touch ID sensors on iPhones, uh, it is impossible for third parties to replace the button. If you take out, you, uh, uh, if you take two iPhones apart, you swap the home buttons on them, uh, they do not work anymore. And there is no way to pair the, the, the button with the main board. Um, it's, it's not the factory, it's done with a proprietary you know, Apple uh, security tool. If you have their secure certificate, you can probably figure out a way to do it. Um, so this is two examples that we're seeing. Third example, Ford decided that it would be a really good idea, instead of patenting the overall truck, so like an F-150 shape, instead of just patenting the shape of the truck, they started filing design patents on each individual part. So they said, we're gonna file on the exact contours of the bumper. We're gonna file a patent, design patent on that. And then if you make an aftermarket part, that fits the truck and looks vaguely like the truck did, uh, you're gonna be violating their design patent. So this is how, you know, a few different ways that they are systematically locking it down so that the manufacturer has control over anything that happens over the life of the device. And that's, that's I mean, it, it, it's those kind of subtle, pernicious, you know, capitalism run amok type problems that, that Right Repair is intended to address. And uh, uh, one sec, Nathan, you, you've been, you've been, uh, Nathan's been working at a state level uh, where states are trying to pass right to repair laws. So obviously you've, you've heard a lot from consumers or, or small business people uh, or sometimes large business people who are impacted by these restrictions. What types of things does, does U.S. PERG hear um, in regard to repair restrictions? Yeah, I mean, I'll be, one example, because I'm going to make the autonomous vehicles and the safety issue because... There are huge safety issues with the, this data play right now. I, I was doing a radio show and someone called in. They were on a boat which had a John Deere diesel engine in it. And the en like it failed. 
and he this guy was like, well, if you can. I mean, a diesel engine will run forever. They're not hard to start. They're incredibly durable. But there was a software lock, and so he was he was drifting at sea. Eventually, someone came in and bailed him out. He called John Deere to yell at them, and they said, "We can't let you, you know, bypass the software to start the engine in an emergency. You might violate emissions." <laughs> it's like I think maybe if you're gonna die. The Coast Guard, you. you know, or, you know, the EPA would be okay with you, and and that's, I mean, but you know, they've they've taken that choice away from us, you know, we and be, for safety reasons, right? And so, you know, anyway, so that's a safety risk. I mean, the, the safety risk of uh, you know, twenty minutes of diesel fumes, you know, potentially from a improperly moderated engine uh, versus being adrift at sea. I think we can, you know, I think I think most people would be on the side of. You want you want to call that for a vote? Unethical? Unethical? Is it ethical for John Deere to prevent you from using your diesel engine, even to save your own life, because you might pollute? What do you got there? Good. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, we. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Okay. So you voted ethical. Sorry. Was that a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you. You're, it's good because don't, don't, don't text and try to pay attention. To that. <laughs> so just it's like when you're on the road driving, you should not text and come to our talk at the same time. It seems like it was a unanimous unethical. Okay. Um, so, but, uh, to to add color to reflect. that, so all of you are saying that's unethical. But when we applied to the copyright office for an exemption to DMCA 1201 that says you can't circumvent technological protection measures. Uh, for the purpose of repairing tractors, the EPA sent a letter to the copyright office saying they were concerned that if people modify the software on their tractors, they would violate emissions. So hypothetically, these are very ethical people at the EPA, and they're concerned. So this is the equivalent of firing the gun to scare off yeah. the Exactly. <laughs> okay, so if you want to ask questions, you will. You want to do a line? Or? Yeah, just, just come up to the mic because we are recording this. So we want to make sure we get your question. <laughs> Oh, this line. is a question line. Oh. Right. So I'm more concerned about, say, for medical devices. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So uh, as a patient, you want to use a disposable medical device. Uh -huh. I claim that it's defective by design. So essentially, if I can't modify that in a certain way and I can't get improved glycemic control, actually, it actively hurts me. Right. So the, qu the problem is, is we just had an FDA recall, very large medical uh, of, of insulin pumps. And I thought that the risk evaluation was poor. And so, it, you know, the, the main threat right now to my having a device that allows me to have my glycemic control is that, you know, my DIY ability is being taken away. So, but these are disposable devices that can only hurt me, and I'm willing to accept that risk, which is different than the car. I just want to know what your comments were on that. That's a really, really good question. I've spent some, some time thinking about this one, and one of the, the major issues is companies aren't thinking in terms of your ability to repair uh, they're thinking in terms of their ability to license and be compliant with the regulatory body that regulates them. So the reason why DIY insulin pumps fall under a, a, a medical device manufacturer's same category as the right to patch something that has been in use in an operating theater is because for them it's all liability. It's not a question of whether or not you are um, you're you're implementing a good or a bad fix. Anything that changes them away from compliance, whether good or bad, causes liability to the medical device manufacturer. This is how you get medical devices that are by design unpatchable or vendors that have gone out of business and no longer can even defend the fact that their patches could be compliant and yet they still no longer have a, a, a purchaser of that equipment still has no capacity to patch that equipment. You'll get regional hospitals running you know, Windows ME on medical devices being used actually on patients at that moment with no capacity to patch not only for the lack of technical skills in the area or in that, um, in, in that particular field, but also because the device manufacturer might still be in business and has told them no device update has been supported. So those two things are the, at the equivalent in a device manufacturer's mind, even though to us DIY insulin pumps and patching surgical equipment seem entirely different, to them they all fall into risk management strategy. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the the John Deere tractor example, 
Uh, it seems to me that that the the uh, the inability of a farmer to repair his own tractor can not only have a significant economic impact on him, uh, but also the local economy. If he can't get out there and 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 plow the fields or harvest those fields, it's not only affecting him; it's affecting the the, the larger community. Um, is there an approach that that could be taken again in a situation like that, where it's seen more as a monopolistic activity, where they're monopolizing the, that ability uh, and and not allowing the users and, and having that kind of economic impact? Yeah, let me uh, let me speak quickly, and then I'll I'll pass uh, on on the first part, and then I'll pass over to Nathan for the the monopoly antitrust question. Uh, you asked earlier about it, 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 are, are we willing to do this even if it's breaking the law? And I think all of us in this room are, are willing to do that. But if you think about yourself as a commercial repairer, let's say you're an independent repairer, it's very challenging for you to build your livelihood based on uh, doing something that is technically illegal because there's always this cloud over you, right? It's going to be hard to get investors to invest in you. So if I wanted to uh, start a company and go out and get venture capital, build a, a replacement John Deere diagnostic software tool, the first thing the VCs are going to ask me was, well, are you going to fly in the face of 1201? Are you right? Are you going to have legal liability around this? And I'll say, well, we got an exemption. And they'll say, yeah, but the exemption is only good for three years. What happens in three years? What happens to the $10 million I give you? Right? So this legal uncertainty really harms the economic aspect of, of the ecosystem. There's another. I would. I would jump. Go, go for it. There's another element to the the legal uncertainty in this system, and I want to talk a little bit more later on about the acquisition of skills at a vocational level that becomes less and less accessible when we require things like four year degrees and membership and research facilities in large companies to do this kind of repair and design. But my uh, the last time I had my own iPhone repaired was a woman owned repair shop in in Seattle. My iPhone 5s screen cracked and then I think what many of us experienced with that one was the charging unit broke on it right so uh, she she and her one of her employees had started a company repairing iPhones now it voided warranties but nobody cared because we had all purchased our devices on the secondhand market or uh, we just were past the point of caring at that point or Apple was going to be more expensive to repair them so she did a complete repair on my 5s for a hundred dollars the um, the existence of this kind of of crunch on small repair shops who can be halted not by a lawsuit but by a C and D, which is an incredibly inexpensive and horrifying thing to deal with if you've never had to deal with the legal system in the U.S. before. So we're not just shutting down these small repair shops; we're actually harming people who previously might not have had access to a uh, a, a valued and respected career running a small business. This is an accessible thing for people who are women, minorities, to start doing with this kind of repair. You don't have to have the kind of privilege in your society that lets you go get graduate degrees in engineering to do design in order to do what you like, which is work on phones or devices or dev design things. I'm concerned about people that lack accessibility to this field now as a result of this kind of legal control. That's a really great point. Okay. And if anybody in the audience wants to ask a question, but not necessarily stand up in front of everybody, just wave or something at me, and I can proxy for you. So, the question will be asked in Big easy, Easy's voice. So mm -hmm. to I, I, I'll have to paraphrase. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to circle back to that Monopoly point, too, because it, it actually dovetails really well what, what Tara was just saying. It's illegal for Apple to void your warranty because that technician opened your phone and, and fixed it. And Apple knows this. Um, uh, because they took the unauthorized, uh, you know, like void, void if removed stickers out of their phones. They figured this out. Um, a bunch of other companies didn't, and they got warning letters from the FTC uh, in April of last year uh, that that's illegal. You, it, it, there, there's a thing in a federal warranty law which says, you know, it, you cannot void the warranty because somebody else serviced the, the product unless you can demonstrate that the product was damaged by that service. Um, because of monopoly. And that, the, the reason why that clause exists was because the people who wrote that law were concerned about monopoly in the aftermarket and repair. Um, they were concerned about companies forcing what they call tie-in sales, which is they sell you something and then they force you to buy other products and services because they've kind of grabbed you and sucked you into the ecosystem. Now, if that sounds weird, because every product that we buy basically exists in that universe, it's because, you know, we are not enforcing our anti-monopoly and antitrust laws. But, you know, that's fine. But then one day they'll be enforced. I mean, so, you know, we were at the FTC and we might show some footage of the FTC's investigation into basically 
monopolistic repair practices by manufacturers. Um, but yeah, this is this is something we, we think that there is cause within our current legal framework to challenge the monopoly practices as illegal under a set of consumer protection and anti-monopoly laws that exist. Yes, sir. I have an interesting question. You mentioned Ford attempting to design patents on like various parts of the vehicles. I'm kind of curious how that actually works because my understanding is patents usually cannot be done unless it's uh, unique and non-obvious. So unless you can prove that the bumper it's a, has it's an a design extra- patent, not a utility patent. So design patents are easier to get because it's it's not a it's not a a, a product that. It's not. It's, it's it's like aesthetic, right? So it's okay. that thing of like shape. this cup is shaped this way, and they're very easy to circumvent. Um, but most people probably aren't going to circumvent them because then you have to spend more money to do that, and you take the risk of still violating the design patent if and, you're trying to. And generally, a repair part has to look like and be shaped like the original part. to fit into where it needs to go. But what you're saying is that essentially you could put an extra dent in it, and you get past that. Uh, I think yeah. I think with design with you, with design patents there has to be some number of differences. I think it's like five differences, and it's completely different than a, a normal um, patent application, which is for a utility patent, which has is supposed to be something that someone knowledgeable in the field can replicate for protection. Design is purely the aesthetic thing, and you could bypass it. I wasn't even aware that that was a thing you could do because I thought that fell more under other things. Because I know that yeah, the utility patent. Example, the Wright brothers did not patent the airplane. They patented the control system because there was not enough evidence they could do that, which led to a fight with Glenn Curtis, who uh, created his first patent workaround and created the aileron instead of wing warping. Good example. Good point. Yes, sir. Hi. Hey. uh, So um, thanks for being here. Thanks for hosting this. Uh, And I'm sorry if uh, if I'm the only one with this question, but it's it's kind of fundamental and... uh, I, I, before I get lost in the weeds, um, I just want to kind of reframe this real quick as a um, <clears throat> in the in the context of ethics. So, if we're talking about whether it's okay to do what we want, ver- even if it means breaking the law, whether the law explicitly says it or just by IP, um, even if that is to help the greater good, we're still following a selfish desire to do what we want, right? Ostensibly, U.S. law reflects the will of the people. If we're, if we're saying, well, this, hold on, this, that's exactly, ostensibly and ideally, right, the U.S. law reflects the will of the people. And if we're saying we're going to follow our own selfish desire, even against ostensibly the will of the people, are we having an ethics conversation of hedonism versus utilitarianism? Or are we just having a legal discussion about whether U.S. law accurately reflects the will of the people? I, too, was a high school and collegiate debater. <laughs> I mean, that, I think that, that question is exactly right. Yeah. It's politics exactly. versus reality, right? Exactly. I mean, and then politics I would, do not always represent the will of the people. And go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there's more than one law and there's more than one interpretation of it. And the exercising of the interpretation of that law um, has not been done by the people. It's been done by the shareholders of the biggest companies in the world. Yeah, so the comment was, if you follow the money, um, authorized repair shops, money goes back to the big corporations, and for independent repair, they don't. And that's actually a great point, because the repair simply isn't profitable, right, to have to have outside sources do it. Product vendors, um, for them, if they're going to authorize repair at all, they want to make the money on it. And that sort of goes along also with, at least on the consumer side, but they, this might be deviating a little bit, but no, go ahead. It, I think sort of tractor automotive versus consumer, and I think a lot of the right to repair falls on some consumer and some other things, is that vendors don't want to deal with having people repair their products because they're basically designing products with planned obsolescence. So they're expecting products that are going to be obsolete in three years and they can move on to the next thing, but hardware usually lasts longer than that. Right. And, 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 and along with that too is the vendor doesn't, that way they don't need to make authorized parts for people. They don't need to support authorized parts and they're not going to make money doing it to, to 
you know, by having authorized or unauthorized retailers. Yeah, so. one, one thing that uh, a point that I'm going to that Nathan actually made in, in one of our many meetings together, but um, that I'm going to remake here, which is to understand that that OEMs want to construe authorized versus unauthorized as a quality as a, as a the qualitative difference. Authorized are better trained and and better and more apt to, and more able to repair. But as Nathan will point out, authorized versus unauthorized is really are you a business partner of ours that allows us to tell you how much you can charge for repairs, what repairs you can do, and what repairs you you can't do, and in which we, as as Joe was saying, benefit financially from your activity or not. And like, it's just a different, it, it, it's important to understand that that is actually the, the biggest distinction between authorized versus unauthorized repair. I'm going to stick a placeholder in here later on for the international equivalent of this and the discussions that go on about information security, hardware manufacturer, and the effects that I've seen in the room of big money and lobbyists in intergovernmental organizations later on. Yes. Easy. Okay. I was being polite. So I'm a hacker. I know people that work at car manufacturers, and I've had drunken conversations with these folks about this exact <laughs> issue. Car manufacturers are in a very interesting position because they necessarily want some of their owners to tinker, and they take a blind eye to what they call tuners because it's good for the product brand. So you do have a lot of gray and cloudy area here where automobile manufacturers know that tuners are going to go out and tune. So, but then again, we also talk about what you guys were talking about. So it's not really clear. Even inside these big giant companies, there's a lot of struggle inside the companies themselves over what do you say publicly? And this necessarily, there's an ethical issue involved, but there's also this tangle back and forth between mm -hmm. product liability and, and things like that because these are going to be autonomous vehicles. There right. is a lot of consideration here. It's a very complex topic. The, 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 and that wasn't really a question, yeah. just a comment. That would be the – that would be – I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It would kind of be the difference between do we want to allow kind of fanboys to like soup up their ride and, 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 and juice it in a way um, by, you know, manipulating – the software or what have you versus do we want to let Joe who owns a corner garage uh, replace a, a headlight assembly or something like and that. The, and then in terms of research and uh, this is a completely new bullet point. We're not no longer talking about any specific car meant that my was just a generalization. I'm going to talk yeah. specifically about diesel gate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. So there was a car company that decided to fix hardware problems in software. I mean, a lot of people know this story. Um, I'm not even going to bother to put up a vote on it. But so I know folks that decided not to get their car patched because they, 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 they would rather have the performance than the, to adhere to what the patch is. So ethical or unethical, if I don't get my golf patched, to actually conform to the law because I would rather have the performance. Am I performing an ethical or unethical act? Mm. Yeah, I'm going to ask a hard question now. That's a good one. Uh, can you actually opt out from that? I think You're opting out by not yeah. right. No, no, right. no, no. Uh, the question is, can you opt out uh, of having the update? You certainly can opt out of having the update by just not going to get your car worked on. Yes, right. yes they were, but they issued a patch and a recall. I read his question is, is it okay to knowingly violate emissions laws as an owner versus a manufacturer? As, as an owner. It's kind of the same thing as cutting the catalytic converter off your car. Right. Yeah. You I can do it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So most folk think this is unethical. We had a couple of ethical. Is there anybody that wants to speak for the ethical side? Was it, was it, uh, yeah. Would you like to come up? Or talk a little louder? No, <laughs> I'd rather so that, so that folks can hear you. Yeah. So, you're, are you. You're not with the EFF, are you? No. I'm okay. He's just got an EFF shirt on. So he does not advocate the view of the EFF. <laughs> views are my own and not those of my employer or the other associations that I endorse. We um, can't hear you. 
Sorry. Um, so I think it, the, the question is, is it ethical for me as a car owner to delay getting a uh, recall? So I've, I've received several recalls on several vehicles. Yes. And some of the re recalls I've read about and said, well, yeah, that's really important. I need to go fix it. And other recalls I've read about and I've said, in my view, the way I operate my vehicle, it is better for me not to have that recall taken care of because the issue that they're trying to address doesn't fit my circumstance. And particularly the one I'm thinking of is a Subaru vehicle where they issued a recall to have the tow hook that was mounted underneath the front of the car removed because if you drove into a parking spot fast enough, you could actually hit that tow hook and it would deploy the airbags. I would rather be able to tow my car. I don't drive fast into parking spots and smash the front of my vehicle into cement barriers. So I elected not to have that recall done in my vehicle. That's not an ethical question, though. With a tow hook, that is a risk acceptance. Right, but so, so that's the question with the, with the Volkswagen patch. The way you drive your vehicle, if you're interested in performance, is it ethical for you to say, I would prefer to have the performance? In my case, I would prefer to have the ability to tow my vehicle. So does a consumer get to choose what recall they need to comply with, or right. is the consumer compelled yes. legally to yes. implement every recall? You're absolutely wrong. Okay. Very rarely can I say this. Okay. <laughs> Come on. There is, there is a huge difference between... We have both the EFF shirts. Between, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go, go, yes. Yes. So there's a huge difference Great. between... Yeah. There's a difference between risk acceptance for you saying I don't have you know I'm not going to drive quickly into it, and you accepting my risk on saying that you will pollute the air to destroy my lungs. It's kind of like the um, you know RAG saying we all as Americans have to accept uh, backdoors in our encryption. He is making a risk-based decision on what he wants, which is not in our best interest. Joe Hook, I don't care if you kill yourself. You know, you can plow into there and die. <laughs> but I do care if you go out of your way to kill me by not getting that software patch updated. So you're not, you're thinking of it as it's an ethical thing from your standpoint, but you're not taking my consideration into, you know, in, in any way. You're like, I just want the performance. And that is absolutely unethical for you to do. You should be saying, I need to take care of Paul, and Paul needs to have good lungs because he's not going to die because he's, you know, because he's not a smoker. You're killing everybody in this room by not getting that software update. Thank you. Thank you. But, but so, is, it, is it ethical to just blindly trust a corporation and, and hope that their patch is actually doing what you think it's doing because their original implementation <laughs> didn't do the right thing? Yeah. Now, that's a different thing because, like, the company – I don't know what the Volkswagen thing, if anybody ended up in jail, but the people who made that decision to do that – should really truly be in jail for a long time because right. Right. they made a unethical decision that affected thousands of people and millions yeah millions you know and like when we look at it it's like we see you know we see that there's the um they'll find them but that money goes back into the government coffers those businesses that are making those decisions as soon as we say okay volkswagen you're done you're just gone now because you guys made a really bad decision Ford and all the other guys will start to make their decisions a little bit differently. Now, if they had that same exhaust problem and they were not aware of it and stepped up to correct it later on, then that would be a different story because, you know, bad things happen when you're manufacturing things. So there's a difference in there. I could, I could oh, respond. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and respond. You had a comment? Is, yeah, it, is it now? Yeah, but I just kind of had a comment about what a few people have said. Oh, so I want to record your flight. This guy likes Corona. <laughs> <laughs> He's not – he does this guy doesn't have an EFF shirt on. <laughs> Speak, Corona man. So something you said about tuners, you know, if you do that ethically or unethically, this kind of counters his point because you're making a choice to pollute purposely just for performance. He's just doing it because he doesn't want to go in the dealer. I'm kind of neutral in that uh, I drink Corona, I guess. But other than <laughs> I, I am sort of a tuner, a novice tuner, and I do own an Audi, which is under Volkswagen, all that. So I purposely... Don't do things to pollute, but you know you drive a car for the hell of it sometimes, and that's something that's kind of done whether you're out uh, without thinking about the ethics. You know, I'm not out there driving uh, 400,000 miles a year, putting 50 bazillion things in the uh, atmosphere. Um, I don't know how much you drive, but um, something people do. You may not think about that, and I don't know if it's necessarily ethics. Well, who sets the limits? I mean, this is just going along with that. Like, who sets the limits of pollution? And by tuning, 
does that really go above the limit? Or by not doing the being, you know, not patching, does that really change how much you're polluting the earth? Or is it just giving more control to the vendor of saying you can't do that because now you're gonna change the way the engine fires? Right. right. And is it just more they're just asserting more control by setting a limit? Yeah. Who's setting a limit? They're probably being funded by the automotive company. I can't you know? give you a, a really good quantitative thing, but I used to live in California and I did some mild tuning on my car and I still passed emissions. I now live in Colorado and there's no emissions where I live, so I don't have a way to actually meter the difference, but I can tell you there's probably people that do that purposely and that might be uh, an ethical question, whereas some people are just kind of doing it for the hell of it and not really thinking about the ethics. So it's kind of interesting to hear people. But what is the output, actually, you just said you passed the emissions still, like yeah. even if you didn't, I mean, the output of your okay. vehicle. Yeah, so I want to make sure I, I don't want to make the video too long. Well, well I know. Yeah, I mean, it might be yeah, here, but because sure. that's what the car companies want, but actually damage to earth. Just doing my job. Man, thank you. Gonna, you know, yeah, I guess there, right? I just so, trying to point out that some people, lower, right? I don't know, I don't know. It's, but there are people, you know, like coal rollers or whatever that is. That's like they're trying to burn the earth down or something. I don't know. But we do have one more major topic to talk about. This is a great discussion. Stick around. We can we can fight about this later. We have two hours for this slide. Yes. Do you have a question? It's going to be quick though. Oh, I'm going to make another comment on the same subject. Yeah. The one, the one point I wanted to make in response to your counter argument is that it shouldn't be a binary choice. Right? There should be some sort of difference between something that's going to endanger myself, right. choosing not to have something done, as opposed yeah. to something that's going to endanger everybody else right. on the road. It should be. It's unfortunate the recall system doesn't have right. grades. There's a clear difference between something that's going to impact you, just you, and something that's going to impact the rest of society. So let me share a quick. Uh, Volkswagen story while we're on this topic. Yes. So uh, DMCA 1201, I mentioned this a few times. This is the anti-hacker law, right? This is the portion of the DMCA that says that it's illegal to circumvent a technological protection measure or lock protecting a copyrighted work, which is anything software now, right? Okay. So we were going through the process, uh, me and EFF and some other friends, of applying for this exemption for farmers and for car repairs to be able to modify uh, and access, you know, bypass technological locks on cars for the ability to uh, repair them. And the Global Automaker Alliance, which is the, you know, the association that represents Volkswagen and others, before this was a month before the Volkswagen scandal broke, they sent in a letter to the Copyright Office opposing our exemption, saying that the emission system in these vehicles is very highly controlled, and only the manufacturers are the ones who have the knowledge and capability and expertise to set the values correctly. No one else should be able to inspect or modify those values, or they could throw the car out of compliance with emissions requirements so and then a month later right here we go and, and so this is fundamentally a question about like who are we trusting what is the trust model and over and over again the manufacturers say it's this authorized trust model trust us Trust no one else. And, and Kyle, remind us who, how did we learn of the Volkswagen uh, emissions? We learned about the Volkswagen thing because these academic researchers figured out that the soft, like testing it in the lab wasn't working. And so they hooked on a physical device to the tailpipe and they drove the, the car outside, right? And, and the software hack uh, that the Volkswagen had said was if, if they detected the steering wheel wasn't moving, then they would change the emissions differently. If you were moving the steering wheel, which you'd never do in a lab, uh, then then the, the software hack was enabled. And so the only way they caught it was, was by inspecting the tailpipe. Now, if we'd been able to dump the firmware and analyze this, it would have been totally possible to catch the Volkswagen hack in software. But because the 1201 was there, it was illegal to do the software inspection that w w would have been required in order to catch this. Now, all of you are saying, yeah, okay, I'm going to do it on my own. But if you're in a formal academic setting, you may have more concerns about it about violating the law of the course of doing your security research. So they found this physical hack to do this. And this is preposterous. This is the kind of thing that when we start saying, let trust the corporations, yeah. it's going to lead society down the path to oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, the, the, I, I do want to somewhat pivot um, to the to the. So I uh, again, um, 
this is a cybersecurity conference, right? Uh, and and there is there is sort of a cybersecurity angle to this. And, and one of the reasons I started Secure Repairs was, again, to sort of mobilize or radicalize, depending on how you want to look at it, the information security community to really start paying attention to right to repair laws that might be happening or pending in your state uh, or even at the federal level. Um, and to understand this is something that actually really intimately interacts with your work. Um, to So... Uh, and and the the point of that spear is that OEMs, manufacturers, John Deere, um, um, you know, CompTIA, TechNet, uh, the big industry lobbies that represent the electronics industry and the technology industry, um, have been making the argument, and Nathan can speak to this at the state level with legislators, um, with whomever will listen, that in fact um, the types of things that are called for in right to repair laws, uh, access to schematics, act to access to diagnostic software and codes, uh, replacement parts, pose a huge cybersecurity risk that you're opening the doors to hackers, uh, as they told the legislators in what state? Um, uh, it's Nebraska. Gonna, Nebraska. Um, if you pass this law, your state will become a mecca for hackers. People will come here just to hack things. Um, and, you know, that's that's a red flag to legislators. Um, so yeah, to... <laughs> right. Um, so to kind of give you a sense of, like, what the industry... Um, a line on this is, I'm going to play a clip from uh, Nixing the Fix, which is an FTC workshop that happened in July. Um, this is Dr. Earl Crane, who rec rec uh, represents the Security Innovation Center, which is basically a front group set up by a strategic public relations firm um, funded by TechNet. Come to you. He is a hired gun. He's a hired gun. Um, but anyway, he this doesn't actually know where his money comes from. He their organizations, and I've worked with security startups. I was at the White House on the National Security Council as the director for federal cybersecurity policy. I've worked in the financial sector and other Fortune 100s. I'm also an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon, where I've taught cybersecurity to graduate students and executives since 2002. And I'm a cybersecurity fellow at the University of Texas Austin Strauss Center. And interestingly for this conversation, back in 2010, when I was at Homeland Security, I was part of the task force where we helped to bring consumer devices into government called Bring Your Own Device. As you can imagine, my entire perspective is viewed uh, through enterprise, through the enterprise cybersecurity lens. I also personally want to say that I'm a tinkerer and I am a fixer, and I appreciate the ethos of the repair movement. I will admit it's very satisfying, uh, the feeling you get from repairing something you own and helping others who want to repair their broken things to help reduce cost, reduce waste, and help hardworking Americans stretch their dollars. See, he's a friend. However, <laughs> oh. there's a big misconception that this is without consequence. Specifically, it can cause harm to someone else, and that gets to the core of my concern. Forcing repair on third parties like enterprise customers and manufacturers can make security worse and not better for all of us, and here's how. First is the loss of accountability for security. It's difficult to hold OEMs accountable for security of their products if we also legislate design changes that will negatively impact security. Second is the risk of backsliding the security progress that we've made. It's not just a consumer security issue because we've merged consumer and enterprise technology. We're so much better. We can't think narrowly about how consumers use technology today, but think of how all of us will use technology in the future as our lives are interconnected and digital, both at work and at home. And third is the loss of consumer choice and increasing costs. Consumers should have the choice to determine what design decisions are most important to them. Maybe it's safety, security, repairability, reliability, cost, and other features. The Consumers more should have the choice though, to an TV. through legislation, <laughs> the higher the cost. So first I want to talk about accountability for security. Consumers have an expectation of privacy and security. They believe that... Is, it, is that good? I think, does that, does that sum it up? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, that, that's sort of the, those are the three horns, I guess it were, of the, of the OEM argument. And um, I guess Kyle and Nathan, do you want to yeah, just sort there's, of... There's more things to that. So. Okay, yeah. I, I don't want to... So, so the, he's, he's gone up against me in a couple different situations, and he's lost a couple arguments. So he had new arguments this time. So, um, you know, he, he makes the, he made a claim that, he's made a claim that basically... Independent repair technicians, because they're not vetted by the OEMs, uh, they could possibly be criminals. And so instead of letting you choose your own technician or fix it yourself, you should be forced 
to use the criminals that the OEMs have hired. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, but but th that that argument has a huge hole in it because if you do it yourself, there is no you know there, you're not going to hack it and steal your own data. Um, so. But then the, and the next time he had a different argument that was about, I can't remember, but it, you know, it, it, they've made arguments that basically the function of the tools that repair technicians use have giant vulnerabilities in them, right? So some lobbying association in Georgia wrote a letter to let lawmakers saying if the Apple Store diagnostic software for iPhones leaked, it would basically, you could access photos and information from any iPhone you want. <laughs> Which it's obviously would, would is a huge insult to the engineers at Apple who design those products. Um, so, so one is that they misconstrue what the tools they've built do, and we don't actually. We can't, it's hard to fight that back because we we don't have those tools. And and you know then they make these these kind of more complicated arguments about the loss of accountability. Um, for the OEMs. I mean, first of all, if they would take accountability for the things that they're deploying in the world right now, that'd be great. Um, but yeah. I think this is kind of what, what Tara was talking about with, with the focus on liability and, and, and uh, as, as kind of the, the guiding principle of their a attitude towards this. Am I right? I somehow managed to be in corporate America without becoming of corporate America. And maybe part of that... Um, had to do with the fact that I grew up on a farm. Um, I, I, we've been talking about farmers. Uh, I, I was a farmer. That's where. I, that's how I grew up. How many of you guys uh, grew up on farms? So the first thing I ever, yeah. There, and and on the audience, anybody else grew up on a farm? Awesome. Um, the first thing I ever repaired, uh, and the first my first repair tool was baling twine. Mm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, talking about the orange baling twine, and the, you you fixed everything with it, mostly fences, um, tack. Uh, cars, tie down hoods, tie down trunks, tie down Christmas trees, tie down junk, tie so, so, so much junk getting tied places. Um, <laughs> and that perspective means um, I can, I could sit here and do the exact same argument that this guy's doing. I could sit up here and absolutely advocate for that perspective and understand why I'm doing it and come at it from a perspective of wanting to save the 50,000 jobs of the company that I'm working for. I don't in general choose to do that, but I understand why this happens. And that, um, that vast perspective from somebody who would be incredibly annoyed at being told that they can't fix things all the way over to someone who understands how to argue on the opposite side is what we're actually missing in this debate. We don't have enough people that understand why people like this exist and and who they're arguing for. Uh, they're arguing for people that are wealthier than we're arguing for, but they're still arguing for people. And and understanding that and coming to this with a spirit of a, of, of compassion uh, means that we end up further along in the debate and being able to assume good intentions of everyone else. I think that collectively people end up with bad intentions from corporations. Individual people aren't bad people or they don't believe they're bad people. So uh, attributing um, kind of boogeyman status to, to one or two individuals respectfully, I mean, I know this, this guy's not, you know, the, we don't have a lot of fans of this guy in our community, right? Um, but attributing boogeyman status to any one single person takes away from the fact that collectively the incentives are wrong to provide the, the kind of right to repair support inside corporate America that we want to see. The yeah. liability issue that Paul is talking about comes from fear. It doesn't come from a desire for money. It comes from a fear of losing your job. For anybody in here who's ever lost a job before because something went wrong in a company, you can feel that responsibility. And this is how ethical choices get twisted to, to make the wrong decision for the right reasons. You're trying to keep your own team safe. I've run corporate teams before, teams of teams before, and sometimes it's very, very difficult to tell the right decision, the ethical decision on an individual level when what you're trying to do is save jobs and budget for the next year when your people need health care. That is how these incentives get so screwed up. Mm. And liability when it comes to either tiny pieces of repair or massive corporate fraud that now uh, that, that, that we deal with from that car manufacturer comes from the kinds of incentive mismatches that create these people didn't think they were bad. The people who hacked these cars to, to change emissions, to change and, and try to ensure that there was no, um, that no reading happened to try to protect their own uh, firmware to make sure that you can detect the hack in advance. It wasn't a hack that was built in. 
that's not a hack when they're the ones that build it that way, right? So they didn't think they were bad people. And understanding that and coming to it with a spirit of compassion helps you start to understand why product liability is the reason being used on all of these cases. A month ago, uh, I have a kitchen that's entirely red. I love cooking. I'm a good, I'm a pretty good cook. I have uh, KitchenAid devices, right? Um, I, and they're all empire red. One is candy apple red, and we'll get back to that in a moment. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, target. yeah. And, uh, and I bought a hot water kettle from Costco. Who's got a, hot, a clear glass sided hot water kettle for, right? Um, any of them that me light up with an LED at the bottom to let you know that it's turned on, right? As a user interface thing. The LED at the bottom of the hot water kettle that I bought was blue. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. It doesn't have to be. Now, um, so. What I did was take the bottom of the hot water kettle. This is an electrical device. Took the bottom of the hot water kettle off. And I understand how this works well enough that I can pull out the two LEDs that are soldered into the bottom. They're soldered into the bottom of the board. And the only thing that they do is power up if the, if the, the switch is on, right? So I understand looking at this, that this is a relatively simple thing to fix, to change, to hack, right? So I go and I grab my Arduino kit. We all have packets of those lying around. I mean like normal people, right? Uh, and, and I pull out a couple of red LEDs and I swap these LEDs out um, with, you know, and trying really hard not to breathe flux because I always forget and breathe flux. We all do. Um, we're all insane here. And swap those lights out and test as I'm going, plug back in. And by the time I was done, I had a red LED light up hot water kettle, right? Super cool. All those, I got pictures. Um, and plugged it back in in the, in the um, kitchen, and it lit up red and I was bounced around and I was incredibly pleased because now my hot water kettle matched. The next day, my double boiler es uh, Pro-Line espresso maker shorted out everything in the kitchen and I freaked out. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, what did I do? Did I do something wrong with the hot water kettle? No, it was unrelated. The internal uh, circuit board had, um, had melted away from a uh, probably a, 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 a busted line on the inside of it. Now, this is a double boil. Now, we're, we theoretically are talking about just hot water and electrical devices in both cases. However, I'm not going to try to repair myself a double boiler in uh, a hard case because a system like that under pressure, I am not familiar enough to fix, right? The problem the, the I can see both sides of thinking that a consumer with those consumer devices can and should be allowed to make the two decisions I made one to, to hack my hot water kettle because I felt like it and I wanted to change the aesthetics of it and understanding that I don't have the expertise to work with with double boilers under pressure with an electrical device that I'm not familiar with and sending it to the only guy in town who will fix kitchen aids and it's annoying because he's a jerk but whatever um, and and please, will there be more competition in kitchen appliance repair? Because I'd love to give my money to somebody else. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and that question right there, that lack of trust of the consumer is mm -hmm. why these companies um, have this concern over liability. They would take that choice away from me to hack things for aesthetics, hack things for repair, because they don't see a difference in the two things that I did. Do you all in this room see the fundamental difference in the two things I did? Right? Ex um, yeah, go ahead. You were also willing to accept the fact that you voided the warranty, which is an adult thing like you were doing. But you forget that most people are children and they will go replace the LEDs, mess it up, and then send it back saying, oh, it's broke. So that's why. Oh, that's not a child. That's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, so two things. One, that's an asshole. Two, and very yeah. briefly, uh, actually, what you did, changing out the LED and swapping it, did not void the warranty. It's not legal for it to void the warranty in the United States. Yeah, but if the company that created that hot water kettle decided that I hadn't sent me a C and D, it would make it whether or not it is or is not. It would make it functionally illegal for me because I wouldn't have the capacity to defend against that law. There's practical law, and that practical law often comes from a corporate lawyer holding a C and D. If it stops you from doing it. Doesn't that serve the same purpose? True. I think this, come, this comes all the way back to the beginning of, of right to repair, yeah. right? And it's the problem with liability. Like, I'm not a debater. I'm a technical person. But, like, <laughs> liability, uh, you know, companies protecting themselves. The people designing these products are human within those companies, and they're going to make mistakes. So it's really, does the company want somebody outside of their company to repair or not? Um, but I, I, I feel like we need to almost bring things back a little bit like, I don't know, 
Yeah, you guys are probably my age. Yeah. Maybe a little older. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you think back to like you know early technology days of home computers, consumer products, um, appliances, you know you would buy a product, you would get a service manual, you would uh, even with Apple Computer, which is which is crazy. Think about this. So Apple Computer schematics you could get, you get bare prototype boards, you could build your own circuitry onto, put it into your computer. Uh, you know, homebrew computer club, you could share things and, and modify things. And that's how the technology market started. And now think about where it is now, where same company, Apple, or same name, you buy stuff, you can you can barely open the thing to change the battery. You need acetone to get the, the battery out of the, a laptop. Um, you have to buy third party batteries and now you're trusting some third party manufacturer to make this stuff. And it's sort of a slippery slope because we've let that happen. And now, if we keep doing that, and if we keep letting guys like that guy, and yes, he's one representative of a lot of companies, but yes. he's very outspoken, and we're more, we don't play politics like they do, right? And it's right. like, we're letting, we're letting this happen. Um, and whether or not you want to fix something to, to turn the LED blue or red, or whether I want to fix something because one of the humans inside the company made a mistake, and I want to patch it and make it better, I should be allowed to do that, right? But but Joe and Kyle, um, and I'm just going to reiterate an argument that I hear um, sometimes from legislators and always from the industry. Um, iPhones and tablets and MacBooks are wholly different from earlier generations of products like toasters and vacuum cleaners. They are so much more complex. They are so much more sophisticated. They do so much more stuff and they hold very, very sensitive, valuable information. So clearly, entirely new framework needs to be applied to them. And talking about things like service and repair, isn't that right? I bet when, you know when those first things came out, they were just as important. And it's almost like they're trying to say, "You guys are too stupid to understand what we're doing. Let us control it for you. Trust us. Everything's going to be fine." Right? Right. We we should be allowed to repair our products, whether it's hardware or software or firmware. To give to give an example, I know there's a hand back here. Back in the day, I was part of a hacker group called The Law. And we would kind of share the good side of the hacker world. Um, and we would find, some of the software guys would find, you know, security problems in, in Microsoft, Windows, and all sorts of other stuff. And Microsoft would say, oh, no, that, that no one's ever going to do that. Um, so we would write exploit code and say, no, this is how someone would do it. And they go, oh, okay, maybe we should fix it. But, you know, vendors were not responsive to fixing security problems. So we were kind of fighting for the users and saying, all right, if the vendor is not going to fix the problem, Let's release the information so IT people, normal people can fix their own security problems, right? Because we can't trust the corporation. And the same thing is still true. If you look at software now, we have Patch, patch Tuesdays and, and software companies, for the most part, are responsive to vulnerabilities. You have bug bounties, all this stuff. The hardware world is not like that. Hardware world is like 10 or 20 years behind, and they're not willing to say, is oh, thanks, thanks, Joe, for finding a bug or whatever. You know, they'll, they'll try to sue me instead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're fighting the same battle that we did with software companies. The software company have been more responsive to that, but it's just something that you know we we need to have some sort of control of the things we own because we just can't trust corporations for anything. And we can't rely on them all the time. Is my feeling. If we make the choice to repair something for whatever reason we should be allowed to do that and we take on liability for doing that depending on what it is but that's our right by owning the thing that we're paying money for not being controlled by some licensing agreement from a company yeah i just just to, to follow up directly to paul's question right like you know the companies make the argument shouldn't we have new rules for ownership it's like if we do they should be decided by and accountable to the people and that problem is is they're not they're held, they're created by and accountable to the shareholders. So, I mean, I, I think it, it would be a good conversation to like, what is safe to fix and who should fix it and what the rules should be. I'm willing to have that conversation as long as the conversation is being held in a way that's created by and accountable to, you know, us. I think another, another thing too, just along that before we do, I guess, questions is always the topic of security comes up. And I know that this, this video didn't show it, but a lot of the companies are saying, our products need to remain secure. If somebody opens it, or they get access to diagnostic tools or the schematics that you know in Shenzhen, um, security is going to be breached, and that's a really, really lazy answer. We heard that it, with the software, you know, back in the day. Also, um, 
You can design secure products and still have them in an open environment that are repairable in the normal business of repair. The problem is hardware is so poorly designed that something like this or something like any other electronic product are, are not designed well. And we could hack things, but instead of designing products well, companies are using the law to make it harder to do. So it's a, it's a lazy response to say, oh, it's, you know, you're gonna break security, something's gonna happen, uh, when they're not even taking the effort to actually design things well. And Apple and some of the larger companies are doing things well, and that's great, but they're also doing things intentionally to prevent the right to repair at the same time by putting this, the sensor in the button, right? Which is like one of the most common things to fail because there's a mechanical interface. So you can, you can separate things and have security and have repairability at the same time, but these companies, the corporations, are putting them together so now they can claim security when it's a bullshit argument. That's, ex that's exactly, that's really well said. Finally, something useful. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That I said. <laughs> so um, we're talking about this a lot. Um, obviously, there have been 20 right to repair laws proposed in the uh, last legislative session here in the United States. Uh, two of them are still alive. 18 have been killed off more or less by industry. Um, but this is not only a U.S. or even a North America conversation, because actually there are right to repair laws pending in Canada as well. It's also an international issue. It's very much of an issue in the EU. Um, and uh, I know, Tara, you have some thoughts and, and sort of some um, insight into how this this debate plays out uh, on the other side of the ocean. You're going to stand there for a minute, just letting you know on this one, because I have opinions. <laughs> hold, hold my beer. <laughs> hit me, chief. <laughs> there we go. You want, do you want me to hit you? I want you. I want you to hit me with the bourbon, not with the badge. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that was the question. And then I'll make sure that you keep yeah. you keep you on track. <laughs> Uh, not ahead, that much go. bourbon. Okay. Um, yes, I do. <laughs> all right, here we go. Right there. Um, <laughs> hardware on an international level isn't 10 to 20 years behind. Um, it's not behind. It's been left behind. No one's looking at hardware anymore. We are so far beyond that conversation in the international security debate that it doesn't even register for people. Um, <clears throat> I have two different lives. Thank you very much. I'm going to need this. I have two different really weird lives. I have this weird life in corporate information security. My, my professional career kind of runs along two tracks. Um, I live in corporate infosec, and then I live in the hacker community. These, um, these two things live over in my infosec career. And I have an entirely other life in international foreign policy and security policy that comes out of academia and international conflict. Um, that's, that's the world that I came out of and I've ended up doing work in political economy and having conversations about cybersecurity at the OECD in, I was at Singapore last week having these conversations. And what is the thing that everyone in the international policy community is talking about when it comes to security? Do you know? Two letters. Artificial intelligence. No one cares about hardware anymore. It's gone. It's, it's so over because the answer is just buy your mom an iPhone. The, 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 the battle we're having here is a battle for attention um, on a lot of different stages because I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm guilty of it. I, I'd love it if my mom would buy an iPhone. Um, and the, the conversation that starts to be had in Paris, in Singapore, in, in Johannesburg, in the places where we have conversations about international security policy and political economy is one where the people even in these conversations want to be thought of as, as thinking forward. A conversation about whether or not someone can repair their tractor is, um, it's not going to land on anyone's desk there. And, and I'm not important enough to be able to have the conversations with, you know, the, the top people or the top people's top people. But I have some conversations with people who can tell you what the next agenda is going to look like. In Africa, the big concern is over waste and repair, but the laws there don't suffice to protect anyone in, in terms of intellectual property for that right to repair. There's huge repair shops in Africa. Same thing we know about, of course, as Joe already said, in China. There are not repair shops like that in the European Union. Um, and the reason for that is multifold, but it has to do with the fact that wealthier countries are less concerned with the capacity to repair. And they're the ones making digital security policy. 
people who are worried about whether or not they can save $25 on a repair of their iPhone and want competition between shops are not talking to the people who are writing international policy that becomes NIST cybersecurity standards, that becomes ANISA, that becomes any of the ACIM guidelines on how we implement security policy inside companies and what those companies can be forced to pay for screwing up. That's the only thing that really matters. GDPR didn't have teeth until people started receiving multi-million dollar fines. Then it became real. It wasn't real to most American companies that GDPR would be a thing. So not just cross-border questions, but questions of wealth and privilege and influence and the people that have access to the kind of skills that let you care about repair. Repair is a skill that is, um, it is undervalued, not just by the kind of people creating the policy that we get to live with, but it's undervalued by people who no longer have to repair things. They, yep. we, we up here, we don't have to repair things. We get to repair things. I got to take time to do a project. I get to take time to do this, and I've got an error message i got to show you a little bit later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that problem is the fundamental one. This debate we're having right now isn't going to surface to the level that anybody can influence from the top down. If there is any lesson that comes from the European Union, from the lack of repair shops in the rich countries, and the the continuing fading away of the right to open up your own devices, it is that the wrong people are making these policies. Or if they are, in fact, the right people, it's that no one's brought to their attention the impact that this has on people that aren't them. The people I see making international digital security policy are busy carting around Valenciaga bags, and there is no right to repair in the top of their brains, right? So when I look at this thing, I think the last part of what I note about that is that this community is the most intractable and allergic to compromise of any of the communities that I'm part of. If you, yeah, if you can't have everything, you'll take nothing and get mad about it. And I'm part of this community too, and there's a piece of me that does this. If we can have some of what we want, we need to figure out a way to determine if we are if we want to keep fighting because we want to keep fighting, or if we've gotten what we need for the people that need it most, the ones who didn't get a chance to fly to DEF CON. There are repair shops in Kenya right now and repair shops in Malaysia right now where the people who are repairing devices that get thrown out here are making tens of dollars per device. These are the people we should be thinking about protecting. Does that make sense? Yes. I am very glad to hear that. And maybe compromise just a hair more. Give people on both sides of the field something to work with. And maybe... I've never seen anybody from the hacker community show up at any of these conferences where this kind of policy is being made. Maybe take a year and go to one less InfoSec conference and go to one more IGO con. Mm. Teach somebody how to pick a lock, Mm. break something open, Mm. fix the settings on their phones because none of them can set a phone for anything. (laughs) Right? But take some time to do that. Cross those boundaries, please, because they're not hearing any of this except for me, and I think they're tired of me. You want me to shut up by now? (laughs) Drink. (laughs) <laughs> so, that's terrific go ahead yeah question all right no <laughs> no question I talk with hand last i checked i was the moderator <laughs> even if i even if i'm i didn't get included in the slide <laughs> uh, what sorry. kind of reporter are you <laughs> Any, anyway i bad big easy we've got about a half hour of discussion left i just wanted to make sure that if any of the panelists has anything to say, they need to speak now or forever hold their peace. I just want to throw a data point out there. When we hear about um, manufacturers and how seriously they take um, security and how important for all these device makers security is, um, Cyber ITIL, um, uh, uh, yes, Mudge's thing and Sarah Zatko's thing um, released a survey of um, 18 vendors and 6,000 firmware images um, covering 15 years. um, uh, Vendors including Asus, D-Link, Linksys, Netgear. um, And the conclusion has been that there is absolutely zero evidence of any improvement in security over the time period and that the level of security that has been consistent is horrendous. Um, and they're gonna they're coming out with that data now. It's the most comprehensive survey of IoT firmware that's out there, and um, shows that vendors absolutely uh, do not care about security of well, their firmware. 
a lot of a lot of those companies too, if they're making okay. consumer devices and IoT devices, are all based on some reference design from some chip vendor. So they're all using the same code base. Maybe they're changing the logo of the boot screen. Yes, it's, they determine that as well. Security, but they're all using some insecure reference to start with, and you can't have security on an insecure reference. Okay. Thank you for that last word, Paul. I need a vote. I have a question. So back in the 90s, we used to drop zero day to straighten out vendors. We, we not necessarily meaning me. This is not the opinion of myself or anybody in the room who might be in law enforcement. Um, they or us or underground or, you know, the vendors had to be taught a lesson. Yeah. So the ethical question to be asked now is, is it about time to start dropping zero day? Ooh. Ethical or unethical? <laughs> so, uh, so, so we needed a clear. Don't tell me what I can do. It depends, <laughs> it depends on what the vulnerability is and what the zero day is and how it affects people. And if we can try to have the company be responsive or not. But if I find something in a medical device that, that somebody could actually go kill people with, I maybe would try to work with a vendor more. But if it's something where the vendor is not listening, or maybe I don't even contact them because they have a past of not listening, or I don't want to get sued because they have a history of suing people, then I'll drop it. And we, you know, I've done that before with the risk of getting sued, and luckily so, didn't. But it depends on what it is, I think. What's your vote? It's half. It, it really is half. Yeah. There's well, a, maybe more or I need to see everybody people. else's vote. This is zero day. <laughs> it's time to vote. Right, it's yeah. right here. Yeah. 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 I go with the two face. Two <laughs> okay, so everybody in the room is now known as cake or pie. <laughs> Let the record reflect cake or pie wins. <laughs> so, does anybody else have anything to say? Yeah. Paul is silent now. No, no, no. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Tara? Tara? I'm good. Joe? Good. Fix I got time. something to say. Ooh. All right. This is your last thing. Then we're going to do questions. I'd like okay. the audience Sounds to great. participate. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a, a question for the audience as you're, as you're asking questions. I'd, I'd be interested in your answer. But my question is, like, we're clearly frustrated. We would like to have the right to repair. We have a path to doing this. In Massachusetts in 2012, there was a ballot initiative that said, do you want to be able to take your car to a local repair shop? It went on the ballot. People in Massachusetts, you got to vote for it. I did. 86% of the citizens of Massachusetts voted for this ballot initiative. So like, this is one of these things. All humans are in favor of this. That's more people in Massachusetts than actually own cars. You'll get your chance in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So like, this is clearly something all of us want to happen. And if we, if we wait 10 years... There's going to be many trillions of dollars more on the other side of this issue opposing us than, than there is now, right? So we have this relatively narrow window where we've got legislation proposed in 20 states. It's been shot down so far this year in 18 out of the 20. It's probably going to get shot down in the next two over the next few months. What can all of us be doing to move the needle? How do we get this from an idea from something that we have consensus on here to something that is actually going to – get passed into the law and start to affect the devices that we have. Thank you. Right to repair, dude? <laughs> uh, no, I'm... Well, Are you good? I'm good. All right, then. Wait, 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 wait. One, one, nope, I've got, I've got one for you. Um, there is one thing I do want to make sure people know, which is that at the very senior level of intergovernmental organizations, um, the large tech companies all send lobbyists. There, there's no equivalent lobbyist for the right to repair, and the people that get heard are the people that show up to these meetings. Except me. Everyone. Did, did, yeah. did I hear Tara need to start show a up. Kickstarter? Gotcha. Let's we start started. a Kickstarter. All right, now let's. It's your turn. One of the one of the things that kept coming up is liability, and for a security fit or. I repair something and make it dangerous or create security flaws or pollute or something. I mean, do you think that should be part of the conversation? If possibly we could get laws that would sometimes clarify when an OEM might be liable for any kind of problem damage that could be caused by a repair? Because I can see their perspective on that too. I mean, honestly, if a guy uh, repairs, uh, misre does something weird to his car or whatever kill and uh, kills himself, I know that 
family's going to sue me as the manufacturer because I got the money, of it, and they're not going to sue him while he's dead, or many of these cases, or any of these things. They're not going to look for Joe Schmo that modified it first, then opened up opened up the security hole or did whatever that caused consequences. They're going to look at me and the manufacturer. Like, well, how'd you let this happen? And I need, if I was a manufacturer, I need to have some answer that says, well, dude, we, the guy modified it in this way and it caused the problem. We specifically say that you can cause this kind of problem if you get in here wrong. Right. I mean, how, you know, if I'm a manufacturer, I want some good kind of liability that can say, yeah, not my problem. <laughs> So I, I'd also be interested in hearing what Tara has to say because she's been talking a lot about this issue. So she clearly has some frame of reference and some expertise. But I would say I like – this is definitely a separate conversation like what the liability is and you know what the what your rights to repair are. They should be separate. There should be a separate conversation about what is the, what's the proper use of liability. But it reduces liability for companies if people have it repaired by a third party because the companies can come in and say somebody else fixed it. It's not my fault. And in fact, you know, in fact, Dr. Earl Crane in that thing said it, it reduces accountability for manufacturers and accountability, another word for liability. Or, so it reduces accountability for manufacturers if other people work on it. So I, and then the other, the other, the other part of this in, in, in the liability universe is like, you know, all of this already exists. Like everyone can already fix their car. None of the other stuff that we do, we've been talking about is the core of right to repair is more dangerous than a car. You know, uh, and and so the the system of liability that we have now it might be broken, but you know it's the the the, the, um, the issues have been litigated before. How many cars slip off of jacks and kill their owners every year in this country? Oh, quite a uh, few. Quite a few, right? Yeah. But nobody's saying you shouldn't be able to put your car up on a jack because it's dangerous and could kill you, even though we all know it is. Right. That's risk assessment too. That's yeah. the same. That's what we're getting at here. Is just like you, you know, when the manufacturer says something like. <laughs> Uh, one person could do this one thing here, and it's just like, yeah, well, that one person has a one in eight million chance of being killed by a shark. Right. You know, I mean, there's, you know, they're going to be hit by lightning twice and win the lottery before this possibly could happen. But they're making a judgment based off of this one single instance, and you're using a worst case scenario to make your arguments. And why to, is anyone right. And to Nathan's point, right. Why is anyone challenging and saying, this is way over the top, your scenario is a, you know, once in a lifetime kind of event. Right. And I think if OEMs were saying, we generally support this, but we have concerns about liability. Right. Um, can we fix this? The repair people would say, absolutely. You know, right. I mean, the gun, the gun industry has huge liability protections in federal law, right? I mean, and, and they're trying sure. to stall. Well, they're just trying to stall us and to push us off. So, I mean, you can imagine a manufacturer lobby saying, okay, we'd be willing to do something on right to repair, but you need to reform tort before right. we can possibly do that. And it's like, okay, let's just, let's, let's just, you can't change the battery in your iPhone before we change tort reform. I mean, so, I mean, that, that, that's, and they might make that argument. Just to get us to to stop trying to fix our batteries. So as a lobbyist for the people, you know, I have to kind of be aware of what their tactics are and just say, like, that's a separate conversation. Have that conversation to your blue in the face. But in the meantime, let us fix our stuff. Or, or yeah. it, it could be intractable. It is. Uh, so I, I, I desperately want to respond to this because I know I, I'm beginning to understand the basis of a lot of this problem. When we talk about liability, and, and I'm, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, when we in corporate America talk about liability, hang on. <laughs> okay. Did, did um, we get that on film? <laughs> uh, so the, the nature of liability does not just exist around personal harm. It also deals around brand protection. Now, and the reason why is I'm going to, I'll, I'll give you the best example I can think of this second. When something goes wrong and a company uh, fails to secure an, uh, an S3 bucket, what happens? What's the headline? Amazon S3 bucket found insecure mm -hmm. and data leaked of patient records, right? Not a tiny healthcare company in, uh, in, in, in Cleveland failed to, to properly secure their S3 bucket and take it off public. Instead, it is AWS bucket found insecure. Mm -hmm. That's what companies are scared of and that's why this is happening. Um, on a corporate level. If I was someone who, and I have been before, been set up to evaluate the brand risk 
to permitting people to modify, alter, or tamper with a product in order to provide themselves with more functionality, I would sit there and think to myself, Mm. what's the headline tomorrow? And the headline for Ford, the headline for Michelin, for letting people change their own tires with the bitty sensors and crap like that in them is not... Um, tiny guy in, in, in St. Louis failed to install three tires appropriately. And as a result, a couple of people died. The headline is Goodrich tires blow up in four different places and six school children were killed. That's why this is happening. And I can't always fix it, but I can tell you that's the reason that corporate liability operates that it, in, in the way that it does. That's why this is so devastating and why it is such an intractable problem. They're afraid that their own mistake is going to come back at them, and they're afraid that anything they do, if they are the biggest party involved in any incident, is going to be the name in the headline afterwards. Even if it wasn't really their mistake, it was just the yeah. fact that somebody could exactly. misuse their product in a stupid way. Oh, yeah. I mean, who hasn't really screwed up configuring <laughs> AWS mean, before, yeah. right? You know? Yeah. But, yeah, that is a problem that has to be dealt with. I can uh, I can kill myself on my motorcycle by drinking and not riding a hel- wearing a helmet. Mm-hmm. I, I Harley sh- Davidson rider dies in fiery crash. I'm not a Harley man, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, I can shoot myself in the foot with my pistol, yeah. but, you know, all kinds of things I could do. Thank you. <laughs> you sound good. Next up. Thanks. Hi, I came in partway through, so forgive me if I'm rehashing anything that, uh, that has already been said. But um, Nathan, you said something about accountability and liability being equivalent, and they're not. Um, and I, I mean that in accountability is, accountability is what allows liability to be assigned. And that can be both a good thing and a bad thing. And to Tara's point, um, and when it comes to corporate America, the the end result of shutting down that conversation and saying, well, it's my name on the headlines, allows for both good and bad, right? Volkswagen would have loved for this never to have come to the fore. They would have loved to have been able to hide behind that lack of accountability. And I think that until we hold them accountable, the accountability is the only leverage we have from a security perspective in order to be able to make certain that we assign liability appropriately. Without that openness, we can't get anywhere with it. And what I'm seeing more and more now, um, you know, I work for a large corporation, you know, Fortune 200, and we have the largest purveyor of spyware in the world as our operating system, as a manufacturer of our operating system. That, to me, is unconscionable. How do we, do, how do we deal with that? What do we do when the manufacturers themselves aren't worthy of the trust they're asking us to place in them? Panel. <laughs> I'm going to let, I've got an answer, but I'd like to let someone else answer this one just and think about it and formulate for a second. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, no, I, I, and I mean, I think this is, um, uh, you know, I think a lot of the arguments against repair do come down to, as, as Nathan said, kind of trust corporations, you know, where we are going to take care of you. We've thought about all of this in, in more depth than you ever possibly could and have designed our products to, you know, maximize your safety and privacy and security. They make these arguments even as, you know, in our, on our online and in newspapers and so on, we see story after story that indicates that, in fact, the truth. Is, is 180 degrees of right. that, right? Is right to repair really the banner that we want to be carrying? Because it really isn't a just a right to repair. It's our, We own it. It's a right of ownership. It is a yes. right of ownership. So there's actually, there's a really good book called The End of Ownership that talks about this. And and, and actually, that's one of the reasons um, uh, that I started Secure Repairs and that I that I, I think this is so important is that, re- is that repair, you know, for the security community, repair is really part and parcel of the work that we do of um, investigation or you do actually, because I don't do much of it, but of, of interrogating products and technologies, figuring out how they work and also figuring out ways in which they're efficient and need to be improved. And if we lose the right of ownership because it's been kind of chipped away, as Kyle talks about, that work is is in jeopardy. 
right now we celebrate when we get a positive ruling from the Librarian of Congress on DMCA exemptions to work on mobile phones and so on. What we forget is that every three years we have to go on bended knees to the Librarian of Congress and ask her or him for permission to do the work that we do. So in essence, our whole industry is one grumpy Librarian of Congress away from ceasing to exist, from us not having the right to jailbreak our iPhones, from us not having the right to, you know, uh, re- you know, look into firmware and analyze how it works. And and I I would expect that, you know, the current administration, if they were to be able to insert a Librarian of Congress, might be somebody who's considerably more um, uh, friendly to the um, interests of industries and OEMs than to independent security researchers. So we lose kind of we're losing the plot a little bit. And the plot, as you said, is is ownership, right? And the rights of ownership um, in in our, you know, effort to fight a war of attrition with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, that's why we need to win our digital right to repair. And in order to do that, unfortunately, everybody in this room is going to have to do things that as security people, we really hate to do, which is go out there and talk to people and get in people's faces and I, so on. I would be fine with giving up my right to ownership if the responsibility to maintain and repair stayed with the owner. If you were, if you were leasing instead of owning, Absolutely. right? So like, so we have no expectation of repairing our leased car, right? right? That's why we leased it and didn't own it. But if you're going to give me the burdens of ownership, including the cost and the responsibility then I have a right to tinker with it, modify it, repair it, do whatever I want with it. Otherwise, I'm, you know, I don't have any expectation of, you know, um, uh, caring for my Spotify, uh, uh, you know, songs, right? Storing them or keeping them from getting scratched or, or whatever, <laughs> right? That's the idea, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, exactly, go, 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 go. you know? <laughs> um, and again, I have no expectation of repairing or servicing my leased car. But my owned car, I do. The responsibility is on me. But there are rights, not just responsibilities. I want to directly answer your question about the fact that you work for an F200 that where you've got your OS that has been manufactured by the largest creator of spyware in the world. Um, to go back to uh, my respected colleague over here who asked the question that was so perfectly uh, framed about the difference between hedonism and altruism, um, the uh, and respected colleague, damn, I'm right back at being 17 again in a Lincoln Douglas debate. Uh, <laughs> the uh, respectfully, again, this community is very allergic to trade offs. You still work for them. I've taken their dollars too. The, the security industry, man. the security industry, the for, uh, Fortune 100, and we do that bec- not just because we enjoy practicing our trade. Um, I, I'm I'm a senior cybersecurity executive. I know trade offs. And they're gross. And yet we practice our trade and we work for companies that make bad decisions. Um, I've got wonderful friends at Microsoft, Google, Apple. And when something explodes in the news, they get asked the question, why is your company doing this? And they say, I have no idea. I'm on a red team and I live over in Seattle. I have no, who the hell are you talking to? Um, and, And yet from the outside, it looks so impenetrable. There are a lot of really good people that work at the car company that we've been discussing all day long who try to keep people safe, and now they've been tarred with an unfair brush. Um, You take their money. I take their money. We all do because we're part of a system where we're trying to make the world incrementally better, and a little bit of that compromise helps. But here's the piece that causes an issue. There's that point that you, sir, are going to get to when you can't take it anymore, when you're done. I've gotten to that point before. When I can't do it anymore and I can't support it anymore, and I think all of us have gotten to that point at this point where we are tired of being told that we can't do what we want with our own shit. And that feeling right there, that, that, that fundamental line between a lease and an ownership is where we hover, understanding that a lot of people, maybe even a generational issue where younger people weren't taught a lot of these skills and the difference between a lease and an ownership isn't real to them might help us all to have that conversation. In a disposable economy, they have no exactly. real incentive to repair. And I, 
And like I said, I'm into fashion and clothes and everything, and I've been to an H&M, and there is no reason to try to sew a seam up on that again, right? Uh, and, and the great part is, is that I'm glad that joke landed because there's like three women in this place, and y'all have shopped at H&M before, and you just throw it away after the fourth time you've watched it, and it falls apart, no? So the disposable economy is part of it, but the, the fundamental part is what is the place you want to draw the line? Um, I've had to draw that line before, and it's cost me money and time and friends and relationships. And... Maybe that's the difference between hedonism and altruism. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I would want to add question. one thing, which is, um, you know, write your pair as a way to have a really meaningful conversation about these issues, right? Like, for whatever reason, pe people want to talk about th their ability to fix stuff, and it's a way to have a conversation about the society that we have, the way we treat electronic waste, the way we treat just things that are disposable, the way that we let corporations control how our things work. I, you know, th that's why I work so hard on this issue because that – I feel like those conversations are like really meaningful to like the future that my kids will inherit. Yeah, so I was debating whether to bring this up, but you brought it up first, the uh, Massachusetts right to repair. So I'm from Boston originally. I live in New York now. But um, – when that was coming out, I remember legislators were taking forever to come up with any meaningful legislation, so it became a ballot question. Yes. And then the organizers of the ballot question struck a deal with the other people, and they tried to take it off the ballot, and they couldn't in time. And then they reversed the decision that they agreed on because the ballot question won, and then it became a mess all over again. So it, it becomes an ethical question of, Who's behind the ballot initiative? Who's negotiating with the opposition? And what the will of the people are when it goes in front of these referendums? And who's really calling the shots in an alleged democratic process? Right? Well, so I'll tell you, who's calling the shots in this process <laughs> is an organization that we set up called Repair.org. Right. Uh, and if you want to get involved in the tactics That's and the, the details of are we doing a ballot issue or not, please join Repair.org and get involved. We need your help. Yeah, yeah, because the, they're the ones behind the bill. And, right? and I mean, like, I'm, I'm the chairman of the board. Uh, Nathan's on it. I mean, all of these guys are right. involved. Like, we uh, secure repairs and repair other. We need your help. There's basically no funding. It's just a volunteer organization. And we are doing our damnedest to get this thing done. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of little tactical questions like that that come up every day that we're making decisions on. And we would love your help with that. Yeah, so the corollary, I have a Subaru um, SDI, right, where everybody mods the ECU, and it's a very gray area about what violates the EULA, what violates the right to repair. So Subaru has this unofficial policy. As long as you can get the ECU back to the factory firmware, they'll agree to honor the warranty. But if you brick it or you can't get it back to the factory, they won't. So that's just super response because they know no one will buy the car if they can't mod it without that kind of thing. But I know like companies like Tesla, I may be incorrect, but correct me if I'm wrong. They have like provisions in their EULA that if you use a Tesla to ride share as a driver with Uber, they'll disable the car. <laughs> it's like you own the car, but you don't own the software that runs the car. And nowadays the car itself is just wheels and metal, yeah. but it doesn't drive the car or operate right. the car. So right. who hey. really gets to say what is ownership? That is the question. <laughs> that is the reason why we need to continue to push right to repair. Because right. if we don't start asking that question, we won't get to decide. Yeah, because cars are eventually going to be all software controlled, yeah. you know. Right. So. And that, that only should, I mean, we can spend another two hours talking about that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll unfortunately, you. we have seven minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that question. So I just wanted to suggest that a root cause of a lot of the problems we've been talking about, at least within the U.S. domestic politics, might be that Citizens United saddled all of the political control with organizations that are tied only to shareholder value. Um, and that the fact that people find themselves arguing for the corporations, the fact that the 18 out of the 20 bills have been shot down and the two remaining might be shot down, the fact that we have a shrinking window of time before trillions of dollars are against us, are, is that the sole organizations that are able to throw trillions of dollars behind initiatives are the corporations that are now people. 
So, yeah. so can I actually respond to that? Because you can respond to that in forty-five seconds. Okay. Go. We have this tool. They gave it to us called democracy, and it's under threat. And if we don't stand up and protect it and fix it, we're never going to have it again. So, yes, it's bad. But you know, I I hate that this. We're not defeated yet. We still have elections. We still have people. And we, we need we need to put it in. We're, I mean, this is this is for the planet. This is for our families. This is you know this is it's all on the line now. It's time to step up. Yeah, yeah and I mean, right? yeah, and um, again, I would I would note, secure repairs is really about mobilizing the information security community. Um, so I'll, I will point up to the thing and say, if you text three three seven 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 to to if you text security to three three seven seven seven, you can become a secure repairs uh, supporter. I had a question uh, along the lobbying for the group. Uh, in particular, um, when we're talking about the cars, actually, one of the biggest spectator sports in this country began because of being able to mod your car, NASCAR, mm -hmm. and you know, being able to look outside the box to find other investors, mm -hmm. even selling partners yeah, that would be willing to team with this, that would love to be able to say that, you know, okay. big finger to the giant tech companies or whomever. Um, okay. How much, we, Thank how much we looked outside the box to find those other corporations that aren't necessarily <laughs> tech Thank you so or anything like that that, we, that might have a, a, can do, you know, do a, a to want. find a, somehow to, to have an ROI for them. So that, you know, again, it's all about the Benjamins, okay. dollars, Thank whatever you. you want to call it. Um, I guess that would be how, how much have we branched out? Where's the imagination as far as being able to branch out to? And then maybe I missed that from earlier. But so in case the manufacturers are listening – there might be some sneaky things that are going on behind the scenes that we aren't telling you about, and it would be surprising to hear. And you'll just have to guess, CTA lobbyist, what the heck we're doing. But yeah, no, we, we try to be creative and think outside the box all the time. I mean, we know that we have – this is scrappy. This is the team of Davids versus the biggest Goliaths you know, in the political landscape. And yeah, it's, we have to be brilliant, and we have to be dogmatic, and we have to eat dirt. Right, and I understand that the, the 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 hill, especially, is very hard to deal with growing up around there, and also having uh, various uh, acquaintances that are involved with that. And the fact that um, even if somebody comes in with an idealistic, it's automatically within the first couple of years just gone because they just want to keep getting reelected, and that's part of the whole entire issue. Like you're saying democracy and, and where our interests lie and where their interests of the people, but um, you know. I, where have you guys um, been trying to show um, an investor where, what the ROI is for allowing people to fix their own stuff? Yeah, I mean, there's a. I mean, it, what we're saying, arguing is going to be. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You need to answer in 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay. It takes. It, 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 if you want to look at assembling this in China, Apple is paying Fox kind of about five dollars to build this thing. You pay somebody here in Vegas to swap the battery in it, it's going to be $50 in labor. So there's there's a economic story, there's a growth story that we can tell here. Right to repair is a bipartisan issue. We've got conservative Republicans, we've got extremely liberal, progressive, uh, uh, you know, anti-waste Democrats working on this. This is a broad, big tent issue. What it takes is people showing up in the state legislatures. We, if you look at the 20 states we have bills in, probably there's somebody in this room from every, every one of those states, right? We need security experts that can that can show up in Albany, New York, and, and talk to the legislators and explain the situation in plain English. Right. We'll get things done. Right. And and help mobilize the local security the community, community write letters. And Paul Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have your chance to say goodbye. I did. But I have an announcement to make. There is an ethical card signed by the panelists. There's only seven. There's Limited only edition. Can I have one? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought so. Is there one that says players? So, Keep your who gets one of six? The panelists each get a card. Who wants number one of six? Do I get to raise my hand? No. Fucking raise your hand. <laughs> it's a race condition. <laughs> Two of six. Right. Tara, three of six. Four of six. Five of six. Now, the panelists did not know. There is actually seven cards. <laughs> there are seven cards. I have six of six and number one, three, three, seven. <laughs>
One of these cards will go for auction at Hacker Jeopardy tonight to the highest bidder. <laughs> the bidding for the 1337 card starts at $10,000. <laughs> Proceeds to go to QueerCon. Mm-hmm. Drink early, drink often at QueerCon. Now, Paul, you have the floor. Sign off. We should be, uh, yeah. Yep, it's um, time. Yeah. So um, thank you, everybody, for, for coming out and listening. This has been, a, a, I think, a really wonderful conversation. It's a very complex issue, and I think we've actually you know, managed to um, hit on a lot of the important points, and I, and I thank Ethics Village for giving us the, sort of the space to do that. Um, what I would say is, um, you know, again, we heard yesterday from uh, Representative Ted Liu and, and, and uh, Representative Langevin uh, that there needs to be more engagement of the information security community with the policy community. And this is something that's really hard for us as a community. I've been writing about cybersecurity for 17 years, and like, I know it. I know it's as hard for us to sort of do policy and do that type of lobbying and advocacy. Um, but when it comes to repair, this is really our livelihood. Um, again, we can keep going to the Librarian of Congress and getting exemptions every three years, but that is a very thin thread to hang our industry on. The right to repair is bigger than that. It's much more fundamental than that, and it is absolutely under uh, siege, under assault from very well-funded, very wealthy, and very savvy corporations um, who want us to be uh, renters of things rather than owners of things. Um, and so we do need to get engaged and you need to get engaged actually not at the federal level, but at the local level, at the state level, um, where these right to repair laws are going to be coming up again in 2020. Um, and so uh, joint secure repairs, if you are don't trust yourself to keep in the loop, we will keep you in the loop. Um, and uh, give you opportunities to lend your voice to this. And I thank so much my my fellow panelists as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs>